it's time to get started. I say it's, it's officially 5.45. Uh, we are really here, not to beatbox, although that would be maybe more fun. Uh, we're going to talk about architecting stuff solutions. Now, some of you struggled through the lab that Darren and I just did a couple hours ago. That was fun. Um, lots of uh, fun and interesting things happened there, some good discussions. I look forward to some more of that here. Uh, this is not the same session. So that was architecting stuff clusters. This is architecting stuff solutions. There is a difference, I promise. So my name is David Byte. I'm a senior technology strategist in the alliances organization here at SUSE. What that means is I spend a lot of time talking with the engineers, our product managers, and our partners trying to do things that help drive business in the field. So that includes making it easier for customers to consume Ceph clusters and to do things with those Ceph clusters. So I work with our ISV certification teams, I work with our hardware certification guys. Um, you name it, I kind of do it. So our agenda today is to talk about the SUSE goals, processes, and artifacts um, around solution development uh, specific to storage. Uh, discuss some of the key considerations when I'm designing a solution and give you some rules of thumb, things that are important when I'm looking at um, hardware environments and I'm gonna try really hard not to trip because uh, that would not be fun. Uh, and I like to walk around um, and I, I will say I'm having a blowout on my shoe. So if it falls off while I'm walking, you'll know it. I've got glue on the way from Amazon. We'll see if it gets here in time. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about some rules of thumb. Uh, about how you build a cluster and hopefully don't have the sole fall off. So the SUSE goals, yeah, basically it says we're trying to make it easy to consume Ceph storage for customers. Um, and it's not just Ceph, other open source technologies, but we care about Ceph in this session because it's in the title and, you know, uh, my friends in the engineering team, you know, really like it when I talk about Ceph. And on the storage specific side, that involves trying to make sure that it's easy by providing step-by-step -step guidance. And I'll kind of walk through a little more of that. So a SUSE solution design, it's not just one piece. It's a, a whole um, bunch of bits put together. We have a hardware implementation guide. And if you go out to the website today, there's hardware, hardware implementation guides for Supermicro, um, Lenovo, HP, Cisco, who am I missing? I'm missing somebody. Dell, Dell. yeah, yeah. Um, how can I forget that? I'm presenting with them on Thursday. Um, okay, <laughs> and uh, SUSE products, so right now we're concerned with SUSE Enterprise Storage, but it's conceivable that these could also involve implementation guides for containers as a service platform, SUSE OpenStack Cloud, um, so that's for SAP. I mean, there's all kinds of pieces that fit into a solution. And then the application integration guide, Veeam, Commvault, Veritas, um, you know, now I'm drawing a blank on everything else that's out there. Storage Made Easy and a bunch of other products that we have guides on the website for, right? So these guides look kind of like this. This is the hardware guide. Uh, for HP Apollo 4510. I put this up here because I spent a lot of my life working on this one. It was a great um, effort. Uh, talks about the hardware settings, includes screenshots. I thought about putting the whole thing up here, but it's like 38 pages before the performance baselines that are in it. Um, so I didn't want to bore you to death with all of that. Uh, but it talks about the, the key settings that we go through. And we, I include screenshots to make it clear what we're trying to do. It is a point in time snapshot. It's not something that you know, I can maintain every day um, because there's one of me and like 400 uh, partners to work with. But we do try to update them uh, on a regular basis, either when the hardware generations get newer or when the uh, software changes significantly. Uh, you will find on our website guides for Enterprise Storage 4 um, still because they're relevant to the greater extent, right? Um, documented process ne about the network design, the OS install, and the SUSE Enterprise Storage installation. And where applicable, and I'll qualify this in a second, we, I am now doing performance baselines. So these baselines are on stock clusters, no tuning, okay? Um, and that's very important to understand because if I tune a cluster, I can tune a lot of performance into it, um, adjusting network, changing things like 
make sure there's no Intel guy is going to throw things at me, disabling Spectre Meltdown, L1TF uh, mitigations, things like that. There's, there's a lot you can do to enhance performance. And if you want to see that, come to my session on all flash clusters tomorrow um, with Intel. <coughs> the software guides uh, kind of actually gave you a few screenshots. They include commands for setting up the pools and uh, basically give you a complete guidance. It talks about the prerequisites, what kind of gateways are required, how should you set those up. Um, I talk about the work done to understand IO patterns. So if you look at the Veeam guide uh, that's out there now, it talks about the data flow of the application. Where is it going? What do we need to do to optimize performance? Um, I will say on Veeam specifically, I just completed a body of work um, that's going to go and reflect an update to that paper on the website. There's uh, some more uh, tuning things that can be done um, to change uh, the target from an all-flash target to one that's spinning media. So that'll be fun. Um, I do talk about storage options, erasure coding versus replication. Should you use the ISA-L plugin for erasure code or not? Um, talking about the data protection, does it make sense to do you know, a, a replica two or an erasure code with uh, two of the EC um, chunks? There, there's a lot of that that goes into these because the application is really where the rubber meets the road. Some applications, you may not need all of the recovery, you know, all the data protection that's there, right? Ceph, you can do a lot of crazy stuff. If you want a replica 10, you can do it. Does it make sense? Eh, probably not. Um, are there cases where you just need a big scratch pool where you don't care? Absolutely. And if you, if you need that big scratch pool, you can do a replica one. Just don't expect to be able to recover it if uh, something goes wrong, right? So we talk about that. And then, like I said, screenshots. So what's the process look like? Um, the first thing is we talk to the partner. If it's a hardware partner, we try to understand what hardware platforms they have um, to offer the critical pieces of understanding that platform. What's the bus layout look like? Uh, what are the CPU options? Where is the magic price points on those where they're most effective to deliver to the field? What's their best price point for spinning storage or their SSD offerings or their NVMe offerings? What network switches do they have that they offer for resale? Um, it's, it's a matter of understanding that partner's ecosystem from a hardware set, uh, perspective. From a software, we kind of talked about that, but there's, a little, there's some other aspects to understanding what are their requirements to be able to recommend it to their customers as a valid solution, right? That's, that's a key important factor. So then the hardest part, getting access to hardware. So how many of you guys out here work for hardware partners of SUSE? Yeah, those of you that work for SUSE hardware partners, you are my best friends, all right? Uh, it, the more hardware you can help me touch, the more information we have to deliver to the field. Um, and that's all helpful to all of us. So then I work through the hardware config, you know, which often involves uh, spending a lot of time in the BMC, um, getting the settings, resetting the settings, doing it in, making sure, you know, iterating through some testing to make sure it's the right settings, stuff like that. There are some general best practices. Um, depending on the configuration we're trying to get out the door that I try to apply and then start from there. And then I write the document. And this, this usually actually, the, the write doesn't take very long. Uh, the document writing takes a couple of days. Then I walk back through the document, so I start the system, reset it all to factory, start again. Walk through it, make sure it's right. When it's not right, fix it, do it again. And, and again, and again, and again, until I finally get it right in the paper. It takes a while, then we publish it, now, what I did miss is performance baseline. Um, to give you guys an idea, I have this really nasty set of scripts that do my performance baselines for me. Uh, basically, I punch go and it does it. It takes five days. So, you know, if you're a hardware partner and you say, ah, you've got hardware I can give you to for three days, uh, that doesn't help me a whole lot. I need about two weeks, uh, kind of as a minimum. And the publish, once we get to the publishing side, um, depends on the partner. Some partners say just publish it, you know, put it on SUSE paper, you're fine. Other partners want to put it on their paper. Um, I'll be honest, the minute it has to go on partner paper, it adds three months to the process to get it out the door. Um, so I like to publish on SUSE paper whenever possible. Um, I do have some really good partners that are really fast about turnaround, um, and I appreciate those. 
Um, HPE is pretty good at that with me, amazingly. Uh, for a large company, they're, they're pretty effective uh, helping you those out. And then periodically, we try to review and update these. Again, um, there's a couple of us that do this. Uh, so sometimes they get a little further out of date than we like, but it's important that you understand. We, we are trying to provide lots of good information to the field. Um, it's just very time consuming. The front to back timeline of this tends to be somewhere between three and six months from start to finish. You have you know, the acquisition of hardware time and you know, the review times and the, all the document cycles. It just takes a bit. So everyone's always asking, where is the documentation? So I thought I'd show you. So you go to products, software defined storage, click where it says SUSE Enterprise Storage. I know that green box is a little deceptive. It makes you want to click on it, don't. And then once you get to this page, go to reference architectures. And here they are. So um, all of our major partners are here. We have links to all the documents we have uh, for those partners. Uh, quite a few papers out here. Uh, both hardware and software. So it keeps getting uh, better and better. So how many people have been to this site and actually used that page? Oh, I know you have. That's not even fair. How many of you knew that site existed? How many of you care that that site exists? Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that I put that in the presentation because that's, that is actually the number one question I get from everybody is, where is this stuff? So now you can't say you didn't know. I've shown you. <laughs> so any questions on the process? I know it's kind of dry, but uh, I think it's important to understand. All right, so let's talk about architecting clusters, what we're all really here to hear about. And for this, I'm going to sit down, and we're going to let Darren Soothill present, and we'll be done. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so some of you saw this slide earlier. Um, Let's understand the storage needs, capacity, performance requirements, IO patterns, data protection, client access methods. When we're architecting a solution, it's about meeting customer need. And that need may be in a generic form where we're saying we're trying to address a disk-to-disk -disk backup uh, environment, uh, whether it's Ravim or Commvault or Veritas, whoever it happens to be. Um, or it may be for, you know, we're an HPC archive. That's a slightly different use case. Or it's for virtual machines in an OpenStack cloud environment. So getting these key items, you know, capacity, when I'm doing it generically, what's a realistic starting capacity for these environments? You know, uh, OpenStack cloud may have a starting requirement of 50 terabytes. Whereas, you know, an HPC archive might be five petabytes, right? The completely different. So we have to think in terms of what that looks like. And that's where we try to get into here. You know, what's the performance requirements of that environment? Is it small IOs in random IO patterns or is it, you know, large sequential writes? You know, um, what kind of data protection is required? You know, the S3 type stuff, we try to do erasure coding wherever possible. It's much more efficient. And um, if you're looking for lower performing file and block, we can do erasure coding now. But you know, those are things we discuss. And then obviously client access method, block file object. And we start working into it. It's always important to understand the application in relation to the Ceph architecture. How many of you have seen this slide? All right, besides the SUSE engineering team that's in here, who understands this slide? Yeah, okay, so a fair number of you, right? Just a quick overview for those who don't. Ceph is a distributed storage technology. It uses objects, and each ob the objects go on OSDs. An OSD is a single device with a daemon associated with it, wrapped inside a piece of tin called a server. Excuse me, server guys, don't beat me up. And we put a bunch of those together, and we have our storage layer. Now, all the state of everything is tracked in some maps that live on these things called monitors. These are great systems. You typically one use with a couple of SSDs, NVMe, whatever you want to use. I typically use M.2 for the OS in these. 240 gigs larger gives me enough space to keep some logs in case something goes wrong. But Rados is what this is called, really. It's the, the object store. Now, this object store is fronted by different protocols. There's block devices, object, and file interfaces that go into this. Block native is RBD, Rados block device. Now, what makes native different from 
a traditional, I'm trying to say the right word so I don't get in trouble, a traditional protocol like iSCSI. Does anyone know besides Lens? What's that? No, what's, what's the difference? Absolutely. Thank you, Cedric. Your five bucks will be, uh, Lens will pay you after the. <laughs> so these are intelligent clients. Like uh, Cedric said, they, the clients understand the layout of the Ceph clusters. They talk directly to every OSD device. What that provides you is tremendous scalability, right? So you don't have one client going through this choke point of a gateway and killing things. So. Yeah, thank you, Lens. It's true for all of the native protocols, which is RBD, CephFS, and Rados native. S3 actually goes through a gateway. Now, I will say S3 is very performant uh, for doing large transfers, but you scale it out with load balancers. Okay. So, any questions on this before I jump ahead? One question. Yeah. Um, Rados native. Yes. C file, there's one. How is that for fast? Yeah. Uh, whew. Mm. Not off the top of my head. Linz, do you know one on, another one off the top of your head? There's, there's a few out there. I, I, I've got a list. Um, C file is the only one I remember off the top of my head. And it's because we actually have a customer that's deployed it. Uh, it's file sync and share. Uh, it's, it tends, it seems like it works pretty good. So we'll see. All right, media types. So you can build a Ceph cluster out of just about anything. Um, if you were in the session with Darren and I, we talked a lot about media types, um, probably ad nauseum, uh, trying to pound it into people. It's a really bad idea to use consumer technology um, where you really need enterprise. Um, anyone not understand why? Good. That means some, most of you are probably in that session. Um, there's a lot of, lot of words that get thrown around. The, the, key one, the key thing to understand is to use the right enterprise class technology to meet the need. And typically that's going to be um, 7.2K spinners. I'll be honest, I have a heavy preference to use the nearline SAS drives over SATA. Um, that's me. I, I have some personal biases um, due to being in the storage industry a long time that pain is bad. Um, SSDs, you know, uh, typically I don't recommend read intensive. There are particular use cases where it makes sense. Darren can actually talk to you about a customer that has deployed read intensive SSDs for a VDI um, application uh, at very large scale, actually. Um, if you don't recognize things like U.2, um, that is a two and a half inch form factor NVMe interface. So you can stick, that's where you get the servers that have 24 uh, front NVMEs. That's how they interface it. So there's, there's just a lot of terminology. The key is to try to understand those. And if you have questions, this is one of those things where it's always good to talk to, you know, anyone from SUSE that's in the store side. We're happy to try to guide you and answer your questions about this um, because it can be pretty confusing. Now I did put in my favorite you know, topic that gets everyone excited, NVDIMs. Someday I will build a cluster out of all NVDIMs. That today is not that day because no one has given me any. Um, they are hard to come by and capacity wise, they're uh, not very large and they're very uh, expensive, <laughs> but they are very fast and I'm looking forward to the day that I can do something meaningful in a Ceph cluster with them. So what should you choose? Well, we've talked about this, spinning rust. Someone's gonna throw something at me if there's a disk manufacturer in here. Um, or SSDs. Um, I will say, when we talk about this, it's a moving target. So if we look at spinning rust today, we're about 14 terabytes for the largest, uh, for largest mechanisms you can get. Uh, 12, 10 and 12 terabytes kind of in the sweet spot um, for purchasing uh, today on the open market. SSDs are catching up fast. We just saw QLC introductions uh, from multiple vendors in, in the last you know, uh, several weeks. 
Uh, when we look at QLC, we're reaching an extreme point of density uh, in flash media with a price point that's getting very attractive. Um, you know, if you kind of base it off of where consumer tech is, you can buy a consumer SSD drive, of one terabyte for about a hundred bucks. Um, enterprise is a little more expensive, rightfully so, um, but it shows where we're getting to in that space. There will come a crossover point. Uh, I mean, if you think about how thick a consumer S or a uh, SSD is, you know, you're talking, they're measured what, five, five millimeter, seven millimeter, right? They're, they're very, very small devices. Um, so you can actually stack quite a bit more. So that gets interesting. SATA, SAS, NVMe, et cetera. Um, SAS gives you the most flexibility. I'll just be honest. Um, you've got higher speeds that you can get out to the disk mechanisms uh, and to an external enclosure if you choose to go that way, stuff like that. Uh, SATA works as well through our, we deploy a number of systems with SATA. Um, the price difference is minimal. Slightly more power consumption on SAS though. Depends on what you're trying to get to. So um, Ceph is not designed for single thread, high performance, low latency IO. Please understand that. Don't come ask me if you can do an OLTP system on it because the answer is no. You, you might be able to try. Um, it's not a good idea. There are more effective ways to get there, right? Um, and please, please, please don't use consumer devices. I'll keep hammering this home. If you don't, if you weren't in the last session, the, the net reason here is consumer devices, there's a, there's a few problems. One, they do caching inside the device. So you'll get this immediate, you know, they perform really good for a second and they drop off in most cases, right? Pretty bad. The other is, is if power suddenly drops from the system, enterprise devices will continue and finish the writes that are in flight. Consumer devices pretty much don't have that technology inside them, all right? So you end up with a much worse data situation. Yep, once the device says, hey, I got it, Seth goes, I believe you, um, and they lie, devices do. I know none of us believe that. Expanders, I talked about this ad nauseum in the last session too. This, this is a situation where you, you're building, say you've got a chassis with 100 drives in it. Um, chances are pretty good you're doing this uh, division of a bus to get multiple drives on it. I hate expanders. They're uh, a great way to rob performance out of the system uh, once you cross certain thresholds. Um, it also seems like another great component that can fail and cause weird behavior, right? So I try to avoid them whenever possible. It's a personal preference. So net what? Who knows what these are? I hope we've all seen them. They're switches, right? Does everyone know how to architect a really great network? Probably not. It is a very important consideration in stuff, okay? Speed matters. Um, you know, when you're doing your network config, Latency is your enemy. So when you're, when you're dealing with speed, uh, I put 10 up here. I really don't like 10 gigabit. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. But you have more bandwidth required for the back end of the cluster. It may not, you may not see it on a day-to-day -day basis, but you'll see it when something fails and you need, need to rebuild, right? Because it's gonna get flooded. It's because the Ceph cluster is gonna go as fast as it can unless you're using the new QoS features coming down the road which is another session, that's the uh, uh, roadmap session, it's gonna kill the back in your cluster. So if you've got 10 on the front and 10 on the back, uh, that's not a good design. Make sure you have ample. So typical, you assume three X replication, so you need three times the amount of bandwidth on the back end that you have on the front. So four gig, 14 gig ports, plan the bandwidth of one for the front, three for the back. Personally, I would put them all in a big giant LACP, LACP bond and then use VLANs to segment the traffic, okay? That's a personal preference. So, who can tell me what the difference is? And if you were in my last session, no cheating, you, can, you, can't, you can't use that. Between five 10 gig connections and a bond and a single 50 gig. Okay, so we've got the hashing. Any other thoughts? All right. So load balancing is important. Um, when you're talking an LACP bond, you're really limited to the throughput of a single stream. So 
10 gigabit is the most you're going to get on a single stream on a, on a uh, bonded LACP 10 gig uh, interface. The other, yeah, cabling complexity. I hate cables. I, I love those pictures you see on the internet you know, that have all the beautiful cabling that I drool on and wish I could do, but I can't. Um, fewer cables, the better. Makes it easier to troubleshoot. And signaling rate. So in case you didn't know, 10 and 40 gig share the same signaling rate. 10 gig, that's one 10 gig channel. 40 gig, four 10 gig channels, right? And you can get the full bandwidth because it's all handled on the back end. 25, 50, and 100 share the same signaling rate of 25, all right? So what you get, is a latency reduction. Now, it may not seem like a lot, but it does matter, okay? Every, every bit of latency you can drive out of your configuration from the hardware perspective is good. And an important thing is your dollar per port, and this probably still has an error in it that we caught on the other presentation. Um, dollar per port is really not that much higher for 25, 50, 100 than it is for 10, uh, especially not more expensive than 40. So you can actually do 25, 50, and maybe even 100 for what, it, what you would pay to do 40 gig today. So when I'm architecting a new cluster today, I'm going with these technologies because these are where we're driving future-proof uh, networks today. Topologies, network topology. So I told you it was a different diagram, Darren, see? So there's a bunch of ways you can configure your network. You have you know, edge, core, hub, spoke, ring, mesh, and leaf and spine. Who's deployed a leaf and spine? All right, I am impressed. You guys want to come talk about how you do it and you know, all, all of the changes that we have to think mental, from a mental, mental perspective? It's a pretty big shift. Um, I have not deployed a leaf and spine myself. I have recommended it because I understand what it does. Uh, the key is in a leaf and spine, everything connects up to you have distribution switches, so top, think top of rack type switches, and they connect back to every spine switch. So there's technology, protocols have um, advanced dramatically, thank goodness, that know how to handle uh, congestion and traffic direction across these, so you get the uh, performance you're looking for out of it. That's how you build a multi-hundred petabyte network for Ceph. Switching mistakes. There's a lot of things you can do wrong in a network. You can buy blocking switches. I have seen that. If you're buying a really cheap switch, um, it may be blocking. If you're, you should look at the back plane of the switch. It needs to be at least twice the speed of all the ports times the port speed. Okay. So if you're buying a 32 port gig switch, right, that's 640 gigabits of minimum back plane bandwidth you should have. Okay. The idea is full non-blocking, otherwise you have packets sitting and waiting for traffic to pass, then they go. That's in introducing additional latency. This was really bad back in my early storage days when gigabit was first coming out. There was, there's a certain vendor that sold a whole bunch of gig switches that were, uh, had like a, I don't know, a 20 gig backplane and 64 ports. Those were horrible. Um, I spent a lot of my life diagnosing performance issues. Not enough uplink. We have seen designs where people will have, oh, I've got uh, four tens or two forties uh, to each node and going to the top of the top of rack switch, which is great. And then we've got two tens coming off the top of rack switch. Uh, you're not gonna get there. You need to think about inside this rack, I've got 18 servers with the capability of delivering 10 gigabits a second each, so I need to have X amount of bandwidth really to deliver effective service out of this rack. Because in a rebuild situation, say you lose another rack, you lose another server somewhere else, you've got to be able to ingest or have outflow from that rack, right? Are they members of the right VLANs? Uh, that's, that's a good thing. And then jumbo frames are usually pretty good. Oh. What, this one? Yeah, jumbo frames are usually pretty good, but there are some situations where 
you go along and, oh, I don't know, you forget to uh, <laughs> enable it all the way across the network and suddenly that packet can't quite get through and boom, it blows up and the CPU on that switch goes to the moon, packets get fragmented and uh, performance goes to hell in a handbasket. And it looks just like that. It's that bad. Hate it. Um, actually, on, on Ceph clusters, um, a good diagnosis, if you go out and you do a, uh, a Ceph status or a Ceph OSD tree and it hangs and you're using jumbo frames, you probably have that occurring somewhere in the, you got it. Survey says, eh, that's exactly what happens. And then protocol gateways. So we do support traditional protocols through gateways. Now, if you think about what you're doing, you're taking this technology, which is this great 50 lane highway. And there's probably a few people in here that have been on this highway. Uh, this is in Beijing, <laughs> I believe. Um, you know, you've got this giant 50 lane highway out here with all this traffic flowing. So say you're using iSCSI and you're pointing it all to a gateway. Uh, yeah, you're kind of funneling that down to one choke point. Just be aware of that. It's never gonna perform as well as in the native protocols, which is that 50 lane highway, all right? So, big consideration, consideration when I'm building a cluster, I want the hardware to be certified by SUSE. Now, we have two levels of certification. We have certification um, for the SUSE Linux enterprise server on the hardware. That is all that we really ask. Um, that means we've gone through and we've tested it. We know that all the components in the system work well, that the drivers are there and supportable. Um, and that everything passes a certain set of smoke tests to make sure it works. There is a higher level certification that some of our partners have elected to do. That's the SUSE Enterprise Storage YES certification. And this is a program where we actually build up the full cluster, you run the test kit against it, and it will inject some failures into the process. It does some things with killing off uh, members of an LACP group, um, which I'll just say some of the tests come from painful experiences we've seen in the past uh, where things weren't quite properly handled by switching infrastructure or NIC drivers or just as an example. Um, but it, it's been tested as a whole and we feel pretty comfortable with it at that point. So those are, those are some key considera considerations when I'm trying to build the hardware side, and this is where most of the time is spent. You know, the software side, like I said, we spend a lot more time thinking about um, the data flows. You know, I'll spend time looking at, um, you know, Veeam is a great example because I, I, it's very fresh in my memory. I spend a lot of time looking at performance monitors on Windows servers, seeing, all right, which ports are busy, where's the storage going, you know, looking at, at uh, basically uh, Netstat, output, you know, figuring out what's connected, um, what do my flows look like, going to the Linux side, doing the same things, so I can map out what the data flow is, because some of these applications, they don't really tell you real well what they're actually doing, and you get into it, and you're like, wow, uh, that's interesting, and then you know where to tune, so I do a bunch of stuff like that. So some rules of thumb, we'll just start off, we support a bunch of silicon, so I hope we all know what this one is. These are our friends at Intel. Um, we also have our friends at AMD. Uh, we do support ARM CPUs. Uh, these are three of the majors. Uh, these Marvell used to be Cavium Thunder X2, High Silicon 1616 Ampere. Um, I forget what they're calling theirs. I have one of those days. Um, these are all supported. So you can actually build a solution with the processor technology of choice. Uh, and we have at least one partner downstairs in the tech showcase that uses ARM technology, okay? Uh, for spinning storage, some rules of thumb. You want one two gigahertz thread per device. I don't care which CPU architecture you're on. Uh, you need enough cycles to be able to get the um, code to run effectively, okay? For SSDs, one to two two gigahertz threads per device. And if you're doing an all NVMe, which I know there are a few people out there starting to look at this, um, two to four two gigahertz plus threads per device. And I will say, if you're looking at all NVMe and maybe SSD, 
you want to up that clock rate as much as you can. The more clock cycles you have, the more effective the storage is. And it's because the, um, quite honestly, the Ceph OSD code um, still needs more TLC. That's probably a good way to put it. And it's getting there. So there are some default values when we come to rules of thumb around RAM. Uh, this is valid for Luminous. Um, it, you know, your mileage may vary and it may change when we get to set 6, which is based on Nautilus. Um, spinning disk default is one gig cache per uh, device. SSD is three gig cache per device. And this is completely off the record, unofficial. Your mileage may vary. Um, not published yet. Probably partially because I haven't pushed it too much recently, I guess. So you take the number of OSDs, take two plus the cache. So this is the amount of RAM the OSD process wants is about two gigs. Take the cache of the device, multiply times the number of OSDs, add it to 16, and then round up to the next logical RAM barrier for your system. On a modern processor, you know, your logical multiple here is the RAM channels per socket times the number of sockets uh, times RAM chip size. So it tends to be like 192 instead of 128 today, right? So you, you're able to maximize the memory band within your system, uh, provide as much as you can to stuff. It also means your RAM chips may be cheaper because you may use smaller. Network, always be redundant. I want redundancy in your top of rack. Um, terrifies me, absolutely terrifies me to have single points of failure. Um, I have been around the storage business, like I said, for about 20 years. I don't sleep well at night if it's not redundant. Sorry. I know Ceph is designed to make that better. This is an enterprise. In your enterprise, you care, you know, if your data suddenly disappears out from underneath everything. Yeah, invest the little extra here. It's not gonna hurt you. Cluster size, we talked about uh, for the network. Um, yeah, just beating this one ad nauseum uh, because I can. Performance of storage devices. 7.2K SATAs are slower than 7.2K SAS drives, mildly. 10K SAS is faster yet, but it's slower than SATA SSDs, which are slower than SAS SSDs, which are slower than NVMe. I hope that everyone understands this. If not, come see me after. I'll point you to Darren and we'll have a, a PhD level course on flash technology. Um, delivered performance in a 3X replica luminous cluster. This is my ob based on my observations. Um, your mileage may vary, no guarantees or warranties implied or otherwise given. 7.2K SATA, around 30 megs a second per device. 10K SAS, around 45 megs a second per device. SATA SSDs around 120 megs a second per device, and NVMe is yet to be decided because I haven't seen enough data to be happy with trying to peg a number on it, right? And the, quite honestly, the performance of NVMe devices varies greatly uh, between manufacturers and models. Um, suffice it to say, I will talk about some numbers on some Intel Optane boards in a session I'm doing tomorrow. Um, where there are, use, there are particular I.O. cases where the Optane boards are 10 times the speed uh, per device of the SATA SSDs. Um, so some impressive numbers are capable there. So when you're pulling it all together, lots to consider and think about. Uh, you have to think about tomorrow as well as today. So when we're architecting a solution, I don't just kick it out for the single use case that you came to me for. I think about, all right, what's your next likely evolution? You may start with disk to disk backup today, but tomorrow you are most likely going to want to put on some virtual machines or this app, you know, XYZ application that needs a bunch of storage. So with that in mind, how often do I kick out a design where I don't offload the Rocks DB and wall to a faster device? Not very often because I'm thinking more in the multi-purpose. Now, if you tell me, you know what, I am gonna have a 200 petabyte content store that's a cheap and deep archive, okay. I, I could say, yes, that makes sense. But if it's something that's likely to change, have changing requirements, design it a little more generically where you have a little more performance option in it. Obviously, take your workload requirements into account. Um, and, I, and I keep beating this drum, and I don't know if people get it. If you're using solid state technology, you have a known fixed lifespan. Everyone knows this, right? If not, 
you have a known fixed lifespan. You can only rewrite the cells on that device so many times before they die. And the devices have a certain amount of overhead. So you can look at the um, performance rating of that device. And there's this thing called terabytes write, petabytes write, um, DWPD, device writes per day, and a warranty period. You take you know, either that terabytes written, petabytes written, or DWPD times the warranty period, you can figure out about where that barrier is. You may have an extra 10% or so, and that gives you a pretty good idea of what your max maintenance expectancy for a device is. There is also this really cool thing on the uh, web uh, called the Petabyte Write Project, where a guy has taken a lot of SSDs and beat them to death, um, quite literally. And he tells you how, what the life expectancy of each one of these devices was and what it actually did in real life. It's a small sample size, but it's quite fascinating. Um, I do recommend reading it because it's quite educational. Um, do please engage with SUSE and partner SEs and SAs if you're designing a Ceph solution. There's a lot of knowledge we have, and we have a lot of guys working this uh, on the SUSE side. Darren and I are both 20 years you know, plus experience in the industry. Larry Morse, the product manager, um, helped design enterprise storage arrays starting like 24 years ago um, at HPE. Uh, Lenz has been around this business for quite a while. Lars Murawski Bree, who is the architect, has been doing HA longer than most people have been alive. Um, so you've got a lot of very, very deep experience. Um, please engage with us. Um, we will make, try to make sure that you're getting the right solution built and architected uh, for the customer environment. And if we don't know, we're going to say we don't know, but let's do a POC. Let's try to stand this up in a way and test it. Some guys like Cedric, for example, may have some access to hardware that they can do things in their partner labs. So do you know, engage with us because we can you know, try to make sure we get to the point where you're able to do something worthwhile. And last but not least, make sure Ceph is the right tool for the job. Again, we'll go back to that OLTP thing. Ceph is not designed for, for a high performance, low latency, you know, single threaded application. If that's what you're looking for, I can help you design one with SUSE technology. That works really, really well. But Ceph is not the answer. So, you know, don't try to fit a round peg in a square hole. It just, it's not a good idea. You'll end up, it might work for a while, and then it might get really ugly really fast. So we, we try really hard to make sure we're steering you to the right use cases. Um, and today those use cases are things like disk to disk backup, archive, um, moving into analytics, uh, where we're storage for analytics. Uh, some HPC clusters, you know, we've worked well, uh, depending on the I.O. patterns there. Uh, Steve right here knows about that, right? Uh, so we, we do have a lot of use cases we can address. But let's, let's visit, you know, going back to that point and make sure we're at the right, point, right spot. Seth for HANA. So I will say we have one partner solution in market today. Um, my friends at Lenovo uh, spent a lot of time working. It's a kind of, it's a customized solution. Uh, it meets all the KPIs for HANA. Um, is something else on the horizon? If I knew, I couldn't comment. So I'll, I'll just say, you know, time will tell. And if something's going to happen, um, this community will probably be the first to know. So with that, any other questions? Feel free to throw things at me. I'll try to dodge. Throw, throw your hardest question out, and I'll have Lynn's answer. <laughs> All right. So we, we still have a few minutes. Who's going to come beatbox with me? It really is quite fun. It's easy, too. You just go. So everyone, everyone go, Poo. no, come on, Poo. all right, now, Ch. all right, so now do it a little faster, Poo. Ch. all right, a little faster, Poo. Ch. Poo. Ch. see, this is easy, beat boxing for beginners, and when you get down, so, Poo. Ch. Poo. Ch. see, that's all it is, it's just really fast, so I'd like to thank everyone for coming, thank you for being good sports.